welcome back. As always, I am your host, Reverend Sean McKenda. And I'm your host, Father Jackson Keller. And this week, we're going to be talking about the absolute classic horror movie, The Exorcist. Originally released in 1973, but we can't get into it quite yet because we do have some pretty major housekeeping we need to take care of first. Yes, um, so if you've been a long-time listener, you may remember that this podcast was supposed to end about a year ago now um, because I was moving to Japan, but then Big Virus kept that from happening. But now it seems like, you know, even though Delta's on the downturn, that it's actually going to be happening soon. Uh, So, yeah. It's, you know, we're, you, you got a whole free year of horse casts out of coronavirus. Uh, so you can thank it for that and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Which does lead us, of course, into our announcement that the horse cast is going to be coming to an actual close here. Uh, we've been doing this for far too long at this point for our viewer count, but we've enjoyed it and we've enjoyed every one of you. So we really do appreciate you all tuning in for these past four, five, three, somewhere in there. Too many years. We've done this for too many years. (laughs) Almost half a decade, if not exactly half a decade. I'm shook. Yeah. Like that. We, we robbed any enjoyment of media from ourselves by making us do this on a weekly basis. We are tired, we are exhausted, and we still have four episodes to be released. Two to the main feed, two to our Patreons. We have these loosely planned right now, but this is going to lead into what we want from you. We have a massive backlog of episodes, but hey, I'm sure there's some stuff that we missed. So, what do you guys want us to talk about? We have one guaranteed slot, maybe two, depending on how things shake out, for you all to pick what we watch. We've done this once before, but this is an official one. This is just it. So... Speak now or forever hold your movie recommendations because I will not watch them after this. (laughs) I I will probably not watch a movie for like an entire year, (laughs) frankly. (laughs) Um, It is funny, actually. I uh, I, I'm glad that we watched The Exorcist, which I guess spoiler alert for my opinion on The Exorcist because it's fucking masterpiece. Um, But like. You know, it kind of comes and goes. You know, sometimes I like after blockbuster weeks, months, it became I was so burnt out on the concept of feature films. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought I was never going to I was never going to enjoy a movie again. It, it also helped that uh, my mom and I went to the theater for the first time in a long time. Uh, we went, went and saw James Bond. So that was fun. That was a fun movie to go back to the theater for. So I guess that's my review of a James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have not been to a theater in like almost two years at this point. And I think part of my burnout is definitely just a desperation to get back into a theater in some capacity. But I'm still playing it probably more than safe. But I listen, it's it's been a long COVID, shall we say, and leave Given it at that. Given everything that's happened, it's it's hard to blame you. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I got a sequester before I go to Japan, so I'm I'm, I'm kind of getting it out of my system now. Like we're probably my mom and I are probably going to go see Dune, but after that, it's kind of the kind of the last hurrah for me. I got a quarantine. Can't jeopardize fucking Japan with a finish line right there. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So hey, listen, this is all to say. Four episodes to go, not including this one, including this one, five episodes. You're listening to to five, uh, but get us your recommendations. Keep them short. Obviously, movie length is ideal. If you do have a show that ends up being about two and a half hours, we can probably manage it. But like anything beyond that, get the fuck out of here with that (laughs) shit. I got to pack. I got to pack my whole life into three bags, guys. I still have a job, too. All right. So, like, we, we're busy. We got shit going on. But we are very curious to hear if you think we missed anything. And I mean anything. Let us know what you've got. We'll see what we can do about it. 
a, a personal request. Please, even if you're not certain that we'll enjoy it, please be something that you think has artistic merit. <laughs> I'm tired of watching trash. <laughs> Put us in strong, please. Uh, Jackson, I think that we should watch Jaws 3D. <laughs> I've already seen it, and I can tell you there is nothing to it. So... <laughs> For now, though, we should talk about things that do have artistic merit, and that is The Exorcist. If you are unfamiliar with The Exorcist, it is the story of a young girl who gets possessed by the demon Pazuzu and Ooh. has to be exorcised and all that. But it's not as clear cut. That makes it sound like this is some paranormal activities nonsense. No, this is a two hour movie and it is a slow fucking burn and it is Wonderful for it. Oh yes. It it feels so much longer than that, but not but not in a bad way. Not in a bad way. It's deliberately definitely- longer. Like it, it's there to make your stomach feel worse the longer it goes. I will say that like the beginning as as much as I love the the Chad 70s filmmakers who will just put like 20 minutes of completely unrelated stuff at the very beginning looking at you with your apes cooper <laughs> but, um you know as as much as i appreciate the the bold and brash factor of that hang i will on, hang admit, on. i can't let that slide go listen to the 2001 episode those apes have a purpose they are thematically they relevant no they are they are they completely are i say that mo- mostly in jest i love the apes <laughs> don't get me wrong um similarly like i love the intro of this movie too and it's own way that it's like a weirdo like the movie you think it's a very simple story like like you said like it is at at its core just about a little girl getting possessed by a demon the devil haha is in the details as to what makes it a fucking masterpiece but like you know you kind of think you know what to expect and then the movie just has Max von Sydow wandering around Iraq for 20 minutes at the beginning like he's Indiana Jones and you end up wondering feeling like what what the fuck was the point of that until it comes back like at at the very end um so you know it's it's definitely it's definitely a slow burn if if you don't have a high tolerance for that stuff this movie probably will try your patience but what if you can't suffer through the beginning of alien it's tap out just tap out it's it's a 70s movie it's a 70s movie through and through and like we love ourselves a good big long stinky 70s movie on this show um but i think i think even if you don't like this one even more so than alien like this one was a real big crowd pleaser back in the day oh yeah i mean i'm gonna talk a little bit about that because i did uh watch a series on shutter it's a documentary series about cursed films and the first episode is about this movie uh and kind of delves into why this movie is such a crowd please and i'll dig into that in a minute but please keep going yeah and then so so i just want to say that like you know even even me like you know a, a a fan a stan even of of like 70 slow burn movies i i promise you stick with it it is it is going places and it'll be when the movie gets where it's going, when that pot is boiling, it's gonna, you're gonna feel that heat. Like, you're gonna, everything is being built up very deliberately. And uh, it's still, this movie still packs a punch. This movie still packs a hell of a punch. Uh, yeah. Yeah, love it. Highly recommend it. If you've never seen it, if you've been put off for one of two reasons, the first just being like it's, you know, Citizen Kane, like reputation is like one of the greatest horror movies ever made. And you're like, eh, it, it can't be that good. Right. It's just like a, you know, story about a little girl being possessed by a demon. How good could that really be? It is. And the other one is that if uh, and I imagine that you know, our, diff- our differing perspectives here, uh, despite our somewhat similar backgrounds on, on this very issue, weirdly mm-hmm. enough, will also play into it. But famously, I or I guess famously to our viewers, not famously to, like, the world. (laughs) But, um, you know, long-time viewers will know that I am, like, self-described edgy atheist, bro. Like, I own it. I'm definitely that guy. It's not always the most graceful or socially intelligent thing to be, but I am that guy. Uh, And if you are also that guy who are like, oh, you know, this movie is like horror rooted in like spirituality and Christianity and Catholicism specifically. Like, what if I don't 
fit into any of those things but i don't really buy into any of that i am like the most flagrantly anti-spiritual person i know i think and i was enraptured this whole time by this movie and it and its themes with with one caveat but we'll talk about that (laughs) yeah this movie is genuinely wonderful in a way that this is gonna you know you know those tweets that go around being like man who's only seen one film hmm this has a lot of cars vibe to it type of thing going on (laughs) that's kind of what i'm about to say here but bear with me if it helps give you the confidence to say what you're about to say i too was thinking about this movie (laughs) yeah i I, I really do think that there is some definitive influence between these two movies i just at the same time it does have that vibe uh but also i have watched a ton of horror movies so i'm not just being that guy uh but hmm got a lot of hereditary vibes in this one uh and far from the actual content of the movie and far more in how it made me feel and that that's more what i feel like ari aster is looking for in hereditary is like that same just constant gross ugliness deep inside just discomfort at all turns like you're just Always, no matter what it is. I mean, Jackson's talking about the beginning of this movie being a slow burn. I loved the beginning of this movie. I was not like I I paid attention to the entire thing. Like there's just something about it that's still very captivating, despite how banal it is for the most part. And like when it does get going, it's so ugly. And that banality really accentuates that. And oh, it is it is much like Hereditary, such a fantastic fucking movie that I don't think I liked i loved it but did i like it (laughs) i don't know because it is just a movie that leaves me feeling ugly and gross inside and that's great i i i sound absolutely of two minds about this thing and i i cannot recommend the exorcist enough despite the fact that it was just really deeply unsettling to me in a way that i haven't felt since hereditary it's just it 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 gets under your skin in ways that aren't really scary they're just more insidious pun not attended because that movie is it's not of this ilk (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's it's a fantastic fucking movie there's just if you watch hereditary and you're like this was too much the exorcist might be as well but if you enjoyed it despite of that Absolutely watch The Exorcist. It's got its own flavor of disturbing. Yes, a hundred percent. And I think I think that you know, even though the the plots aren't really similar, I guess the plots are kind of similar. Like when you think about it, yeah, they um, both kind of have that like, are we actually haunted or not kind of vibe yeah. to it. But like, there's definitely a lot more stuff happening in hereditary just like there's some key differences yeah there's there's some key differences but no like uh, what it does have in common with hereditary and that i think is you know extremely effective in both movies is how much of the movie is sort of about those more domestic fears about like the family and your health being out of your control and your family members being out of your control and like all that shit melding that with a supernatural <laughs> twist layer uh yeah the hereditary is a little different because there's more traditional kind of twists and turns more of a, more of a plot whereas this is a lot more of characters walking around being miserable for about an hour and, tw- and 40 minutes and then an exorcism happens. And I say mm-hmm. that with only the, the highest of praise for that plot structure. <laughs> yeah. There, there is something genuinely wonderful about a movie where pretty much nothing happens for the most part. Like that's something that horror movies, good horror movies do really get at. I mean, that's even the beginning of hereditary. Like there's some underlying supernatural stuff, but not until the party does anything really start to go off the rails. And then from there, things get worse and worse and worse. Uh, So it, a good horror movie knows how to pace itself and isn't just ooga booga booga at any time it can. Oh man. When, when this movie gets going, like I was, you know, I, I I was sort of not, sure how i was going to respond to this movie you know for all the reasons that i said both you know because of my religious background and because of my uh you know just the you know i'm I'm not the famously i'm not the biggest horror movie guy and like you know it's an old movie and i'm like 
all right, like let's let's see what it's got. But man, there there were a lot of things about this movie that were you know genuinely upsetting and stomach turning mm-hmm. um and oh even god. more so if you do have that catholic background god <laughs> do you feel it sean do you feel the 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 horrible identification with the main character and his crisis of faith oh fuck i mean really yeah but i mean even beyond that like oh jesus well well, I want to talk about that a little bit more in spoilers because it does dig a bit into where things go with this movie. And I mean, obviously, everyone knows that it's an exorcism movie, but like the granularity of it is I, I don't want to get into. There's there's just a lot of depth to the writing and the characters. Like, I think that's that's the biggest strength is that like it is a simple movie. But when I think about a lot of the scenes and a lot of how like things play out and like how characters react realistically, but in ways that maybe you don't expect because you kind of have this image in your mind of what like a tropey demon possession movie looks like. Um, like it's it's got that by keeping it so grounded, it's it's able to sort of take you along for the ride like a drama does, but then still hit you with a lot of like, you know, a lot of the a lot of the good stuff from a, from a horror movie, a lot of sickening imagery, a lot of like great atmosphere, um, just really, really deserving of every single amount of praise it's ever gotten, frankly. Some good medical horror thrown in the mix yeah, there. Yeah, I was not ready for that. I was not prepared for that. But those fucking, hosp- those fucking hospital scenes, Jesus. I could not handle it at all. I was fucking squirming the entire goddamn time. One thing that I love that the hospital scenes reminded me of is that, like, on its own, even if there's no threat, of like you know the the demon presence coming in and making things worse like i think that's one of the things about the movie that makes it so tense is that like horrible horrifying painful shit is already happening and you know that at any second it can get worse when old paz shows up <laughs> <laughs> i mean the other element to that too though is that there's that horror of what if it's not though like yeah. what if it is like we genuinely have to undergo surgery and then we get into like a little bit more of a book of henry's category there uh but like that's its oh, own God. level of horror <laughs> no, you're right why why are we doing this we're comparing the exorcist to book of henry we've sinned forgive me father because it's a good comparison it is and that's the worst part Ah, uh, the Book of Henry sucks so much shit. Jesus Christ. Uh, fun fact, just to, because, you know, I did a little bit of extra research here, and God damn it, I'm going to use this extra research. Uh, there is, in fact, a real-ass murderer in this movie. I, I did see that, yeah. He's like a child murderer in a scene with Reagan. <laughs> no, uh, not a child murderer. Like, there, there's a lot of things being conflated about it. Uh, oh, like, okay, okay. He, I, I thought I had read that, but... <laughs> he, uh, the, the dude who asks Reagan to move from one uh, gurney to the other uh, killed in a drunk, high fit of passion someone and, like, then willingly turned himself in. Like, he, it was... It was genuinely tragic. Like it is not oh. this whole big cursed thing that everyone makes it out to be. It was genuinely this dude who made a horrible mistake while intoxicated after like a long night of drugs and sex, and then like called the cops and was like, "I fucked up. I fucked up. I'm sorry." <laughs> Well, I'm glad you were here to correct that because I'd only seen like the tabloid version where he was like a seri- a child serial killer. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. And honestly, th- this is kind of goes back to that whole when we were talking about why this was such a gangbuster hit of a movie. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the movie really played into the PR that this was a cursed movie like through and through people are talking about like, oh, yeah, I was thrown up the entire time. Someone passed out and like or quote unquote passed out in like the first 10 minutes, which I don't really know what would make you pass out in those first 10 minutes no no way no way not the first 10 minutes (laughs) so there's a lot of really drummed up hype around this movie that lends itself to that it's a cursed film on top of the fact that the director is the auteur of auteurs that's right slot him in there with kubrick 
because he's done some horrible things to his actors. Yeah, the, pew, 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 there's there's pew. there's the seventies, you know. Good, you know. Hitch, Hitchcock throws a bird at a woman once, and everyone thinks they can do it. Fun fact as well: most of those horrible things are the scenes that they used in the movie. Yes, uh, that's. I I feel like that's distressingly common with these uh, ab- abusive crazy director types because i'm pretty sure i want to say was when we were talking about kill bill i'm pretty sure that like the take where uma thurman ended up getting like fucked up in a car wreck because of tarantino's carelessness ended up like the first part of that was used in the movie Mm -hmm. i think um so when you have like a when you have a psychopath on the on the helm you know it tends to eh, it tends to go that way Mm -hmm, mm-hmm mm-hmm well, hey, let's get into spoilers. Cause I want to talk a little bit about the scenes where these people got injured. I think that's fascinating. I want to dive a little bit more into our own religious interpretations of this movie and where it might fall short in a bit of the modern era, though how much that impacts your viewing depends. So before we do, as always, though, if you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us on Twitter. I know we're ending in two weeks, but you should do it anyway. Just show your final burst of support for us, as well as Patreon, (laughs) patreon.com slash B-A-D-H. Kath, tell your friends about us. We are 400 downloads away from hitting 20,000 total downloads. So, like, if we could push through that before the end of October, that'd be fucking rad as hell. Tell your friends about us. Encourage other people to download our podcast. We'd really appreciate it. One last push. Let's do it. Let's do it. You'll have been there on the ground floor when we come back as, like, some magical like Siskel and Ebert second coming 10 years down the line or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be like, I remember when they made a joke about Vince Vaughn being born through a Jurassic park window. Who are we kidding? Sean? Well, we'll always be making jokes like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is Cisco and Ebert got nothing on us. <laughs> we're the, we're the millennial brain rot version of Cisco. and Ebert. <laughs> Well, as we said, uh, next week, we're up in the air right now. If you have something you want us to watch, please let us know. You probably know how to reach out to both of us. Do it. Do it now. For now, though, let's get into spoilers. Yes, let's. So uh, do we want to start talking about uh, the product of the director's sin? I I think that seems like a good place to do so, mostly because this isn't as spoilery. So if people were kind of like, ooh, I want to hear that at least, we can do that first. Sure, sure. Sounds good. So the two big scenes that did get in the movie are both scenes where uh, the actor injures their spine, actually. Uh, The first, the most horrific one is where Reagan is flopping up and down on the bed, getting yanked back and forward, back and forward. She had a thing wrapped around her that would hold her in place but on this take it came undone a little bit and so she was just slamming up and down screaming crying and she's talking about how the the actress was talking about how uh everyone thought that she was just acting her heart out in this scene but in fact she was breaking her spine oh fuck so that is the scene that we watch in the in the movie. So congratulations. You watch like a teenage girl do horrible damage to herself if you watch this movie. Uh, additionally, the scene where Reagan slaps the mother and she yawn, gets launched back into the window. Uh, the director told the people who rigged up her yanking apparatus to just give it a real good yank this time. Uh, And they do so. And you can actually see her reach behind to, like, feel her back as she's howling because it's where she got yanked from. So that's also the scene that's in the movie. Uh, Well. Fuck. (laughs) Auteurs are the fucking worst. And they make some of my favorite movies. Can't deny that. It's it's not worth it. (laughs) No, because because like on on the one hand, like I'm sitting here, I'm like I'm trying to put myself in the in the mind of the actor, and maybe like you know I'm just a sicko. But if I was filming a scene where I where I broke my leg, 
and it looked the best out of all of them. I think maybe this is just my sicko, like, say in pride at my heart. Well, you got to use the fucking broken leg seed. Something has to come of this. God damn it, you piece of shit. Like, almost almost like revenge. I don't know. But yeah, it's good that um, it's good that there's more oversight so we don't have to ask these questions anymore. Or, 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 or all, we, it, it, it still happens, but it's not as celebrated shall we say for good reason on a related note uh a lot of the people who work on films right now are currently on strike for better conditions and better pay and you better fucking believe it we are absolutely supporting that cause so absolutely uh not like the chuds on twitter who are like where are my marvel movies (laughs) (laughs) what if this slows down production on ant-man into the butthole come on (laughs) <laughs> daddy didney needs to feed me <laughs> oh fuck me yeah uh so this is why film oversight is important because otherwise horrible horrible things happens to our actors uh and apparently gets put in the movie and i'm right there with jackson where if i snap my leg in a take you better be fucking using that take but also, don't break my leg for a take, you assholes. No, yeah, to, to, to be abundantly clear, like, it's it's easy to see, like, and, and, and I think that's one of the reasons it's worth talking about, is that it, that it can be easy to jump to that fallacy, like, if you don't think too hard about it, like, oh, of course, like, you know, the most physically strenuous, challenging acting is going to produce the best results, uh, you know, and cherry-pick examples like this, where, like, yeah, okay, like, the scene of Reagan, you know, getting hurt is, like, a really effective scene, but it wouldn't have it's been... It's because you're actually watching a girl scream in pain. And it's not, like, in order to get, like, that's that's a requirement to get a really effective scene. Like, that's where I think people, you know, cross the line on this method, active stu- method acting stuff, and not just like, you know, the crazy directors, but even just your average Stop viewer. Stop sending me rats, Jared Leto! Or, or even something more innocuous, like, um, oh, like in The Revenant, like Leo had to eat that buffalo liver, and like he, he you know, he threw up. But then that even that, like that's a great example, because that creates like an inconsistency in the movie to create the image of just like being really hardcore because Leo's a vegetarian. So, you know, we actually did that and, you know, he threw up because like, you know, whether physiologically or ideologically or both, like the idea of eating that liver was, was sickening to him, but like an actual frontiersman wouldn't have been so disgusted by that. So it wasn't even realistic. It was just there to say that we put Leo through some bad shit so we can impress people and get an Oscar. He didn't have to do that. Leo, I saw Wolf of Wall Street. I know you can act. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I, it's, this might be the final time, but it's worth beating home as always. Don't beat the shit out of your actors. We've talked about this many a time. It's it's just not worth it. It's called acting for a reason. Like because I think even Lawrence Olivier like said that on on the set of a movie. I can't remember who the actor was. Like oh, I got to get into character. He was doing a a Jared Leto like bit. And he's like, oh, I just can't do the scene unless, like, I do my little method acting thing. And Laurence Olivier, like, you know, one of the most celebrated actors in all of Hollywood was like, have you tried acting, dear sir? <laughs> <laughs> and I, th- I think that's like, you know, you, you can't fucking argue with that. So, no, we didn't have to break this this poor child's spine in order to get an effective scene. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's no good. It's no good. Shall we start to descend a little bit more into the madness that is religion? Yes. Um, do, do you want to start off on this one or should I? Because I only have one little bit, little little hang up, we could call it, I guess. Well, yeah, l- let's go ahead and, and get you going first and we can segue into my stuff because I do have a bit more to go off of. Yeah. So because, you know, this this movie's great. This movie's ma- a masterpiece. But if, if I've got one qualm. It's it's, you know, as as is expected of me at, at this point, it's an ideological qualm, which for the most part, like, you know, the fact that I am not religious and and even like actively opposed to a lot of like spiritual stuff like that didn't affect my enjoyment of the movie because like the the characters were so realistic and richly written. And like, you know, even if you aren't 
religious or like you you know what whatever you want to say like you think you can't like identify the the characters act like people enough and like it treats the the subject of faith like even addresses it from that perspective and like characters act in ways you don't expect so that wasn't a problem for me what was a little more of a hang up was how thematically to me the movie kind of reads as a condemnation of like medical science in favor of faith and spiritual healing and there are two reasons i was primed to think about this one of course is covid anti-vax stuff and the other was that i just got done watching eye patch wolf's video about fake psychics which is a great video where he thoroughly like goes through and debunks a lot of sort of fraud like psychic mysticism stuff meant to exploit people and with this movie obviously as someone who is you know deeply a religious slash anti-religious like the idea of you know in real life someone taking their child to an to an exorcist instead of a doctor is deeply upsetting to me but that's something that ideologically like you know the writer of the story very deep catholic and you know that's that's fine and all but it's something that i think is like that's some place where the movie and i are never going to see eye to eye on that and like that's fine i can put i can put that out of mind even though like you know sean i think you you have more research supporting the the idea that this did have some measurable real world impact Uh uh-huh it definitely did it's maybe not massive especially not as much anymore but like there definitely was an uptick in exorcisms following this movie because up to that point most people just really only heard of exorcism as a, a, a thing in passing i mean the movie itself even references like the first thing you need to do to get an exorcism is to go back 200 years or whatever yeah and that like you know, on on the one hand, it's some it's something that we've brushed up on, like you know, time and again, occasionally here on the show, like when a a piece of art has like some thematically unsavory things that have some sort of like real world impact that isn't good, like how much of that is like this one movie's fault? Like how much of that can we lay on the feet? of the exorcist and that's 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 just so hard to say especially because in order i think for someone to be in that position and the eye patch wolf video like lays this out really well we'll link it for what it's worth if, if you're curious to what he's referring to we will link it down below yeah but just just to sort of summarize like a major point from that is that like you know a lot of people who approach these sort of fraudulent therapies i guess or or like practices you know people who go to those are like emotionally unwell they're highly distressed you know traumatized by this or that and and with that like sure like you know they may have been inspired to like seek this out because of the exorcist but like is you know is that movie going to create the underlying conditions for someone to go to that so i mean it's it's like movies do have a real world impact for sure art definitely does but i also think we shouldn't be too quick to lay all of society's problems on this one thing and especially because like if if it were just like i'd be a lot and i think sort of the difference is like honestly honestly i do think quality matters because if if i'm comparing this to something else that i was much harsher in condemning like shin godzilla the thing about shin godzilla is that i thought that movie was like straight up propaganda and like didn't do much beyond like beyond that Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know uh whereas with this like although like you know it's it's pretty much demonstrably true that it had some sort of like real world you know i would say negative impact it's also true that like this is like just as a work of art like how what are we not seeing like you know the the invisible stuff that happens on the individual level like someone who really loves and resonates with this movie like help them figure stuff out so you know i mean that's that's why i try not to jump to conclusions too hard when it comes to like condemning stuff like this just on you know just on the case of one 
you know, every individual work is part of a broader tapestry, part of a broader like sociological trend. Uh, but, you know, you know, it's 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 all very complicated, which is why I try to speak on it with some sort of nuance, unless it's Shin Godzilla, because I fucking hate that movie. <laughs> I, I do think it helps, too, that this movie doesn't necessarily come out or it doesn't even read as entirely anti-science throughout most of it. I mean, the priest no. that does come along to do the exorcism is like, I am a psychologist first and foremost. I am doing this just because I am now convinced that this is beyond what we can accomplish in this way and even everyone else uh, around the the medical science and everything like that it, it's never laid at, at their feet as like you failed to do this it's much more like a you can't do anything about it and that's just a failing of science but like I still trust you for your diagnoses. I trust what you have to say about my daughter what you recommend I should do I'm going to take that under consideration it's never being like Fuck science, it's only religion. And, like, that's something that even Cursed Films, like the documentary was kind of getting into. They were talking to both religious and horror scholars about this film and kind of exploring how people perceive it in that way. And it it has a lot to do with just, this is a movie about coming back to faith, not necessarily reneging on everything else going on in your life about going turning your back on science. I mean, again, the priest in this movie has an attachment to science, to hard science, and not just religion. So there, there's more to it than just being like, eh, don't get your kids vaccinated. They're going to put 5G in your <laughs> bloodstream. It's far more, it, it's definitely just more about the spirituality of it than anything, and that there might be things going on underneath the surface of our world that could be a bit more insidious. But even then, it's clearly designed to be so so painfully niche that it's not like ah your cousin had a seizure it must be the devil no no they're epileptic it it's (laughs) take them to a doctor please (laughs) yeah it's not saying that everything that goes on is some sort of supernatural thing in spite of the fact that it did spawn an increase in exorcists yeah and and this is why this is why i say i think that like the quality and depth of the work on display like do matter like how much like is someone you know going to reckon with and like feel a thing because this movie is very good like you know lest anyone accuse me of saying that you know doctors are infallible and they've never gotten anything wrong like you know there, there are plenty of occasions where uh people have suffered this or that because of medical malpractice and this movie does a great job capturing a lot of those anxieties so it's still like it's still talking about something that's real and like that dynamic between the like that's just so interesting like like you you almost never see this in movies that it's the priest who's like advocating for the more like medical like secular approach while the uh you know the the patient is just like begging for you know the fucking spiritual approach and that's su- that's such an interesting dynamic i love all the scenes between um uh the the actress mom and the and the main priest i can't remember anyone's names except for reagan unfortunately <laughs> i know uh the act the, the priest is damien yeah yes father karis i know I, I don't remember the mom's name yeah i, I unfortunately either. don't either but max von Sydow is max von Sydow. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i think that 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 interaction there of like the pushing back from the priest really does also lend credence to the fact that this movie isn't anti-science or even yes. like overtly i mean it, it's pro-religion but it's not religion uber alice it is just religion yeah and and like you you can tell that the psychiatry in the movie is is not being like although it may like seem and look ghoulish to a modern audience i mean there's still like men- mental health institutions are not like you know they haven't gotten super great in, in the meantime as someone who knows people who's like had to like be institutionalized for a bit for one reason or another and like checked into like a psych ward um it's uh, you know you, you would hope that it's gotten better than what we see here but you, you know shit not sucks much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's going to depend on where you're at, obviously. Like, you know, if you're in some shitty rural little town, as, you know, all the people I've talked to have been, that's, you know, that's going to be a lot worse than mm-hmm. if you go into some top of the line hospital. It varies. But yeah. Um, and so so it's not like it doesn't feel like a Shin Godzilla and that we're ignoring all of the 
like complexities of real life to propagandize some stupid harmful thing and that's that's why this is i think is still a fucking banger and a masterpiece and even though it's 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 a minor quibble mm-hmm. at best <laughs> it's especially so far removed from like it's heyday now i, I, was gonna say, I, I think it, it is uh, a minor quibble on the whole but it's one that stands out to you a bit more whereas yes for me this movie as someone who does not have that same anti-religious ethos running through them i suppose uh, i've talked about this previously i am not a religious person but i do not necessarily begrudge people their religion as long as they are not you know being assholes about it and i include all forms of bigotry in there fuck off uh but if if you find like a, a comforting faith in in religion i mean that's great I, I there's part of me that does envy that it sounds like something that would be nice to be able to believe and buy into myself i just can't find that at this point and that is a bummer in a lot of ways which is why this movie resonates with me in some ways hey! uh, <laughs> but I mean, we'll get to that in a second i think beyond that this movie is more so just being like hey religion can be that panacea for you but it's not going to be the panacea for everything because uh, even though that's exactly what a panacea is so i guess i kind of fucked this metaphor <laughs> huh no, but like you're totally right because one of the things that um is even brought up in the movie is like and and it's sort of cuz you know well I will say like you know lest I kind of keep memeing that I'm like the Reddit atheist bro and you know in some ways I kind of am but I also understand like I am also a fan of stories and as someone who uh it's it's pretty familiar with especially like uh the biblical stories at this point there there's a lot of value that can be gotten out of it in that way um but like there's there's almost this like book of job like element to the movie of like the with uh father Karis and the situation with his mother like one of the things that he's so like fucked up by he kind of he kind of blames his faith a little bit it seems like that you know he's a church psychologist and you know maybe if he had you know, sold out more or less and kind of discarded that and just gone a more secular path. Like maybe he would have had the money to like, you know, really care for his mom and like make sure she was all settled for. So that like plays into his guilt. Like the movie addresses these questions with a lot of nuance and a lot of, you know, deeply <laughs> upsetting personal, like, like, you know, depth to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's part of it too, though, is that, as you said as deep-seated reddit atheist as you are you are still a person with nuance and not someone who is just unequivocally hardline this is bad for xyz you 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 see the the wiggle within that system as you literally just t- talked about yourself a little bit there like i, yeah, I think that's yeah, the no, for sure important thing to remember is that there's nuance everywhere and shades of gray are important y'all <laughs> that's just a lesson that, that's a free one for all of you shades of gray exist and they are important and not everything is black and white and Twitter's a hell site. That's very relevant as much as it doesn't seem like it is, but retweet. Ha ha. Also, there are at least 50 shades of gray. Ugh. I've seen all those movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know what? If you're still here and you're looking for something for us to talk about, I could talk about the 50 shades movies. We're not going to do all three, but if you recommend one, it might happen. It, it it might not. Keep that in mind. But <laughs> I can talk about those movies. I have lots of thoughts about them. It is technically a, a, a cultural touchstone that I am basically completely ignorant of. So it it would serve some value to me as a person, I guess, to know what the deal is with Fifty Shades. Just be aware, you're going to get Cats too if we do that episode. <laughs> I mean, the Cats episode was marvelous. You know, the I, I if, as long as you can be Professor Shaw, you know, I'm totally fine. Like, you know, sitting back and getting a college class on some track. <laughs> <laughs> well, but listen, that's that that's that's for the future us to deal with. God, I just a, a quick aside in case we don't talk about that. Um, I we were watching. I don't remember. 
why we were watching it then, but I remember it was around the time that we put up our Christmas tree a couple years back, and there's a Target across the street, uh, and we were drinking and having a grand time, and we realized that it was cheaper to buy the Blu-ray of Fifty Shades Freed (laughs) than it was to rent it. So I walked across the street, definitely a little drunk, and bought... (laughs) The Blu-ray from Target. The problem was is that I had to go. I did the self-checkout and it rang up as more expensive. So I had to get someone. I had to talk to someone. I had to talk to someone while I was a little drunk and being like, hey, this, according to the Target app, should be $4. Oh, my God. That is. That's so fucking good. (laughs) Jesus Christ. How? Like, you told me the story about you buying the Blu-ray because it was cheaper. You hadn't gone into such glorious detail about <laughs> that evening before now, though. Yeah. Um, so I have a history with Fifty Shades, to say the least. But, again, not here, not now. Right now, I want to talk about my own religious views as how they impacted this movie because as we've indicated uh the damien the the priest is definitely a bit lost in how he feels about his faith he has some regrets about it some frustrations he's not sure and by his own admission that he is still one who believes in the faith so watching this i'm like oh okay that's interesting but i'm not super identifying with damien at this point i'm i'm fairly past my Catholic upbringing at this point, although it still does haunt me in some ways, namely in the Catholic guilt. Uh, It's not (laughs) until I kind of started to look at this in retrospect and realize that, oh, a lot of the reason that some of this horror hit me in the way it did was mostly in how the movie treated priests, namely how Reagan treated priests, just constantly yelling at them to stick a cock up her ass and like, gee, fuck you, come fuck this cunting whore and everything. And they're just like yelling at a priest in this way. And like the fact that it was this small girl yelling at a priest is so uncomfortable to begin with. But like, Again, as someone who is not like a hardline anti-theist or anything, I'm mostly looking at this like, this is horrifying to me because that's just not how you talk to priests. Catholic Church scandal noted and big noted on that one. But like, to me, priests are still people who help other people. And to just sit here and just shriek like that was upsetting to my core in a way I wasn't even fully processing while I was watching the film. And it, it, I understand why when this movie came out, so many people called it cursed, called it horrible, called it a, a, a tool of the devil in so many ways, despite the fact that it is very clearly a religion positive movie, but there is so much about it that is just feels ugly in religion in the eyes of religion that it's really easy to fall into that because that plays into the conflict with reagan or R- rezuzu <laughs> i guess <laughs> like you know because you know she does the sort of on that same level like that's kind of the that's maybe one of the fears that we're getting at like this sort of you know, betrayal of someone who has your best interest in heart. Cause you know, that extends to the mother too. Like, you know, she, Oh my God, like the scene that made my stomach turn in the movie most was the, was the crucifix scene. Mm -hmm. Not just cause it was like, uh, you know, a child, like, you know, it's shocking enough to like see a child engaging in some like sexual activity, but forcing that upon her mom, like, Holy shit. Like that's, that's not only like on the face of it, you know, something disturbing that uh, 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 that was not intentional. I hate that I said that now, <laughs> um, but that's like, you know, you know on the surface, <laughs> something, <laughs> something that is, you know, disturbing on like a guttural level. But, you know, it also plays into that, you know, broader feeling that like, you know, this is 
her mother. This is a, you know, not not just an authority figure, but like a caring figure. And it, it's it's pushing taboos just yeah. across the board in ways that I mean, even horror movies nowadays, we don't see as much. I, I think, I, again, I keep going back to like Hereditary and Ari Aster and A24 in general feels like the place that's going to be pushing these sort of social taboos, whereas a lot of them feel a little bit more just like we're going to kill some kids. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Watch out. I, I think I think in hindsight, I've been thinking about this because this is one of the things that was disappointing to me about the it movies, because like that story in, in conception is a lot about like trauma and like, you know, kids having their concerns like swept under the rug by adults. But instead of making a, a real movie out of that, like this or like hereditary, um, they made boo clown. <laughs> and I, I mean, like in, in line with that, just to continue to kind of prod this a bit, it has a very infamous scene in the book. Sure does. Uh, that if, you are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. Good. Leave it at that for yourself. You don't really need to it's know. It's just about a clown. Don't worry about. Don't worry your pretty little head about it, listener. Yeah, don't think about trains going through the sewers or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. I almost got through that, and then it caught up to me. Oh, man. It was like running from a train. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ, where are you going with this? We can't linger on this detail. <laughs> where I am going with this is that, like, that is pushing that social taboo. Like, that is something that the movie just never did. And it's probably good that the movie didn't incorporate that scene into it. But within the book itself, it was at least there and like, hey, this is fucked, right? This is right scuffed. So I, th that the lack of that scene, while arguably good, probably did more harm to the actual quality of the movie because it lost some of that transgressiveness that lent itself to just being blasé. I haven't actually read the entirety of the book, so I can't make a comment about this scene in particular in all likelihood it's probably true that because you know there's there's that thin line right between something that's that's shocking and upsetting because it's prodding at some like tattoo that like tattoo taboo that really makes you think and then there's like the south park line which is like you know mm -hmm. we're just gonna we're just gonna do the thing without without thinking about it at all basically we're gonna do the thing because we can um and betting dollars to donuts uh that in the context especially knowing how it part one and two especially part two turned out that it would be executed without like really any thought put into it like that it would be there essentially just to be edgy but like oh a hundred percent to be clear yeah. just to uh, I, this is entirely a theoretical piece including theorizing that this scene in the book might have a greater thesis to it i'm just more looking at how it sanded off edges continue yeah, i just you're... i needed to defend myself there a little bit too no, because don't... i know what i was saying See, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah no i am uh, completely fair but um because like yeah even without Having read the scene, and even if it is exactly as, like, tasteless and dumb and, like, you know, high on cocaine as it probably is, I, I bet you, just from, from the conception of it, that in Stephen King's coked-out mind, he had a grand thesis about, like, you know, a fucked-up, like, traumatizing way to, like, go from childhood to adulthood. And, you know, that that is a theme in it. <laughs> it is not thematically irrelevant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, uh, I did Stephen King do it well? Probably not. Would would the would the movie makers have done it well? Almost certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> I have I I've got a middling relationship with Stephen King. I've read the entirety of the Dark Tower series. I think his stuff is all right for the most part. I, I really should go back and revisit it now that I have a little bit more uh, like media awareness under my belt and see how I feel about it a bit. I did watch the It movies, one fairly early on into the podcast, didn't like it, one a year or two later after doing this for a while, feel like I'm 
pretty acquainted with media literacy at this point. Still didn't like it. I'm, yeah, those movies wouldn't have done shit with it. No, because well, Stephen King's interesting just because he is like, I, I almost admire the uh, chutzpah of it, that he just like churns these books out and like 75% of what he churns out is garbage. And then like, you know, the other 25% is like an all timer. I just saw a fucking Facebook post about the fact that Picasso made like 10,000 paintings and a hundred of them are worthwhile. So like, it is a fucking numbers game. That's why we've been doing this for five years, Hell baby. Woo! No, it's it's. I think about it a lot because it's a, it's honestly it's the Chad approach that like you know you could sit here go and like meticulously make you know your your perfect thing and you'll have made one thing in ten years. Meanwhile, in those ten years, Stephen King wrote fifty books. Forty seven of them were complete trash, but just by accident, he wrote two that were pretty good and one that is like a cultural touchstone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oops. He did it again. Sorry. Stephen King's not always the greatest writer, but I, I got a fondness for the scamp for the old scam. <laughs> I, you know, I, again, a middling relationship with him with his text, I suppose. I respect the hell out of the guy fl- fl- flat out. Yeah. Respect the hell out of him. Do we have anything left to say about The Exorcist? I feel like I've exhausted my side of things, talked about the religion of it all, the the cursedness of the whole thing, the the culture around it. I feel like I'm pretty good. No, yeah, me too. Like, this, this is the sort of movie that I said my piece about, like, anti-vax, whatever connections. Uh, but mostly what I want, you know, the takeaway that I want people to get from me is that, like, even if... If you've heard a lot about The Exorcist and for one reason or another, you're not sure whether it'll live up to the hype, whether you'll like it, uh, give it give it a chance. It's worth it. I, You know, it's 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 a like it's got its reputation for a reason. I, I will say toss an asterisk on that because it is still a very uncomfortable movie and it is not like your conventional modern horror movies pretty much at all. So that's so true. Um, And, and like that's so interesting because I know there are people who you know, because it's an old movie and it's kind of slow at the beginning, like, think it's boring. Think like, oh, haha, she's spitting out pea soup. Look at look at the oldsters and their old timey horror. So it's it's so crazy because you're right. That asterisk should be there that, you know, this is potentially as upsetting as I found hereditary. Like I per- it didn't hit me on that level, but I could totally see where you're coming from on that. Mm-hmm. But like it's almost unthinkable to me that like like i don't understand where the where the haters are coming from on this one like are they really just are their dopamine receptors burnt out by like you know annabelle <laughs> is that just <laughs> it like the nun jumped out and went spaghetti and i screamed <laughs> screamed and clapped <laughs> I've been Sean McKinda. Find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKinda, where I will continue to tweet things after the podcast is over, so you should still follow me. And I'm Jackson Keller over on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller. You should still follow me because I wrote a book. It's called Kelly is Unbreakable. It's a great read. Uh, He says putting the medal on himself like that one Obama meme. (laughs) (laughs) uh, You know, whatever. We got to do the hustle. But also more more maybe more importantly at the moment, uh, I've been doing finally after promising for so long, I've started doing video essays. I uh, just recorded the voiceover. I might re-record it. Actually, it didn't. I think I think I got to fill with the audio anyway. But like needless to say, we're in full production of my next video essay. It is about. Uh, Left for Dead and Why Back for Blood will never be able to replace it. Uh, so does that sound interesting? Does that, does that sound like a hot take, a controversial take? Then you should you should watch it when it comes out in like a week or two. <laughs> I'm in it as the cameraman and maybe yelling 420 <laughs> at one point if Jackson decides to keep that point in. <laughs> Follow the podcast at BDH underscore cast on Twitter and also tweet at that handle with your recommendations of movies that we should be watching. I will keep an eye on it. Let us know. We got two weeks filling in for us. We're lazy. Do our work for us. Patreon, patreon.com slash BADH cast. As I said, we got two more bonus episodes going up there, so don't cancel your your shit yet. I promise we're not going to charge you for November. We're going to suspend it. We're going to just put an episode up there and then... From there, we're just going to put it on hold and you'll never get charged again unless we decide to come back at some point. But we'll warn you before we do. So 
There, there's that. Also, thanks to our ten dollars patrons. Thank you so much, Julia, Travis, Pat, Mom, Summer. Y'all are great. Also, thanks to those that use our theme song is "Suicide." Also, take off the album "High Octane," low expectations. The normal band. You should go check them out wherever you can. Buy the music, streaming music, all that good shit. Also, 25 years later, site.com. If that website still do what it does, there should be a button of us in the corner. Click on it if you want, but also check out the people who are working over there. There's a lot of really talented people doing a lot of really talented writing. Go read it next week. Who fucking knows? You're deciding for us. What are we watching? It's the Mario Kart item box. Will we get the, the glorious blue shell that will take us to victory? Or will we get the shitty banana peel that makes us scream and cry in frustration as we languish back in last place? Barbie Horse Adventures. Bye! <laughs>